regular upload schedule. I will release a part fortnightly, maybe three weeks. So it turns out it's much harder to create and upload a video in two weeks when I'm back at work after the Christmas break. As you can probably guess, it's finally finished and I'm pleased with the result. I won't make the mistake of promising a turnaround time for the final part of the iceberg, so make sure you subscribe to be notified when the final part is out. The benefit of subscribing to me is that there's no chance of being spammed with daily videos. This is part two of the Dungeons and Dragons iceberg explained. If you're looking for a complete experience, part one is available in the link below. However, if, like me, you prefer the deeper sections, stick around and you can maybe just go back to part one later. Again, don't forget to subscribe if you enjoy my content. It means my videos are more likely to pop up in your and others' feeds, rare as they may be. A lot of work goes into these videos, so I do want them to be seen. Below the surface. This is where we start to see entries that only D&D enthusiasts would know about, though some entries might also be known to those with an immersion in internet culture, especially the more iconic stories. As a warning, I will omit an entry in this section and another in the next section because they are, or can be considered, piracy tools or resources. Call me a wet blanket, but I don't know enough about copyright law to confidently discuss them. They are the only two entries I will omit, and there wouldn't be much to say beyond what they're used for. Bag of Black Hole In 3.5e, a portable hole is a magical item constituted by a combination of phase spider weave, beams of starlight, and strands of ether. Before use it resembles a circular piece of cloth, and once placed on a surface, it creates a portal to another dimension, which is 6 foot in diameter and 10 foot deep. It's used to store items, but anything can be placed in there, including living beings. Though, once the portal's closed, there would only be enough air for a creature to live for around 10 minutes. A bag of holding is another magical item that is larger on the inside than it is on the outside, about 2 foot in diameter and 4 foot deep. If it's torn, ruptured, pierced or overloaded, it's destroyed and all its content will be scattered across the astral plane. Ever wonder what would happen if you put a bag of holding in a portable hole? I can tell you. Both the bag and portable hole are sucked into the void and lost. Alright, what if you put a portable hole in a bag of holding though? Well, a gate to the astral plane is created, then the hole, bag and any creature within a 10 foot radius are drawn in, destroying the hole and bag in the process. It is a one-way gateway. That sounds pretty exploitable. Yep. Yeah. This is an over-engineered insta-banishment to the astral plane. Let's hope the ranger doesn't roll a one. Taras Karaoke. This entry refers to Dingo Doodle's story about Sips, the wild mage, and their drunken karaoke performance with severe consequences. I've added a link to the video in the description below. It's a funny story based on a wild mage who, in trying to give a stellar performance, inadvertently creates a dead magic zone during said karaoke performance, which leads to the release of a Tarask imprisoned under the city. The story escalates further and further as roles make the situation worse and worse. It's a great example of a story which someone can enjoy whether they've played D&D before or not, and I expect it introduced the game to a good number of current players, which is always a good thing. That guy, rules lawyer. We all know that guy. He could be a lot of different things, but they're all infuriating. He could be a rules lawyer, who robs the joy of D&D by arguing with the DM over minor rules to his own benefit, often incorrectly, but always conveniently for him. That guy might be the one who steals the limelight. That guy could be the one who actually steals from other PCs, or even kills them. That guy could be the one who doesn't pay attention until it's his turn, then insists on someone giving him a breakdown of what he missed. That guy could be the one who is metagaming at the table, or the one whose character is min to the max. That guy adds extra gold to, into his inventory here and there behind the DM's back. That guy might even be the creeper who hassles players in and out of character and who ignores boundaries. That guy could also have poor hygiene. That guy is the guy who generally makes the experience less fun for everyone at the table. Don't be that guy. Sir Barrington. This is a classic green tech story and one of my first exposures to the wide storytelling possibilities D&D can offer. If it's a true story, the DM seems to have played loose with the rules for the sake of fun, which I think is totally acceptable for player enjoyment, as long as it doesn't lead to imbalances. I'll read the green text for you now. 
Make a bear character in D&D 3.5. DM laughs. Make bear a rogue. Put every point I can into disguise. Prestige class as a spy to get more disguise. DM says I can't speak English. Max out bluff. By growling and gesturing, I can fake speaking a language I don't speak. English. Use money to hire a butler NPC. Give him magical item to let him speak bear. Growl. An excellent suggestion, Mr. Barrington. We really should ask the group to investigate the Black Marsh. Over the course of the game, be knighted to Sir Barrington. Queen holds a dinner in my honour. A guest becomes the first man to ever make a perception check that can beat my disguise. Shouts out loud. Hey, that guy's not a guy, he's just a bear. Man is escorted out of the castle while the guards apologise profusely for the indignity. We're so sorry, Sir Barrington. Very sorry for this man's behaviour. Roar, shrug. I rolled to seduce the dragon. For the uninitiated, you might ask, who in their right mind would roll to seduce a dragon? And to answer that question, I won't offer an individual, but a class. Bards. Bards are notorious for playing campaigns as Casanovas, rolling their way into hearts and bedrooms. The idea of rolling to seduce a dragon is a meme or joke in the D&D community, though if you look it up, you'll find plenty of players telling their stories of attempting, successfully or unsuccessfully, to seduce dragons. Some are more wholesome than others. Tomb of Horrors Tomb of Horrors is iconic in the D&D community, though I'm still undecided on whether it's fame or infamy. There is no doubt that it's beloved though. Developed by Gary Gygax in 1975 for tournament play in the Origins 1 convention, and later published in 1978, Tomb of Horrors is an adventure module set in the world of Greyhawk. Gygax developed the module to challenge the expert players in his group, whose characters, up until that point, had become so powerful that they were nigh invincible. The dungeon itself has a focus on traps and puzzles rather than combat, which was the first module to do so, and has strong incentives to make poor decisions in the pursuit of riches. More likely, the PCs will find death, or complete annihilation. The plot surrounds the undead wizard, Acerarach, in his ancient tomb, with adventurers attempting to slay him and take his treasure. There are stories all over the internet of players' ingenious plans to beat the tomb, with varying degrees of success. But even with a solid plan, bad luck will end a run. In 1998, the Return to the Tomb of Horrors module was released, again focused on Acerarach, and is itself considered one of the greatest D&D modules in history. Are you sure? For the love of God, if your DM asks you this question, stop, think, and consider not doing that thing. DMs generally want players to have the freedom to judge how their character would act, so if they ask you this question, you're probably on the verge of permadeath, or are about to derail their campaign in some way. Personally, I often ignore my own advice here, if I've made a decision in character, I don't generally like to retcon it. However, in my particular situation, my DM likes to psych us out sometimes and make us doubt ourselves for his own amusement, so it's a slightly different situation. Centaur stacking. Centaurs can be ridden by medium-sized creatures. Centaurs are themselves medium-sized creatures. Therefore, centaurs can ride centaurs and there is nothing holy in this world. Turn undead. Clerics have the ability to turn undead. Whilst this sounds like an epic skill whereby clerics turn undead back into dead beings, change their alignment, or perhaps even turn creatures into undead creatures, the reality is that turn undead quite literally turns undead enemies around by pushing them 15 feet away. It's a channel divinity where essentially a holy light causes the undead to retreat somewhat into self-defense. Still, a very useful spell, though it sounds a lot cooler than it really is. Sigil. The D&D multiverse is made up of multiple planes and realms of existence. The material plane is the default setting for most adventures. Each plane has its own rules, laws and features which make it unique, and they can vary drastically from being hell realms to realms of elements, energies and even death. There have been different cosmological explanations for the relationship between realms through D&D's history, though currently in 5e the Great Wheel cosmology is the most popular. The Sigil is a hub city floating in the Outlands, containing multiple portals to every plane, and it's therefore important for interplanar travel. Inhabitants consider themselves the centre of the multiverse for this reason. An interesting feature of the Sigil is that it has no sky, 
There are buildings around its edge with no windows facing out, but beyond that, there is nothing. Falling off the edge would result in being sent to a random plane. The sigil is ruled by the Lady of Pain, who controls all of the portals. She's less concerned with the day-to-day -day running of the city, that will swiftly and severely punish any who cause trouble, either through death or by sending them to one of the inescapable Lady's Mazes. As the sigil is a hub, items from across the multiverse can be found there, regardless of how obscure they may be. The city itself is neutral, meaning anyone can enter and are forbidden from fighting or causing trouble, regardless of alignment or status. It could therefore be a good place for a DM to facilitate a motley crew party meeting one another. Pathfinder Pathfinder is a modified version of D&D 3.5e, sometimes called 3.75e, and was released under the then Open Game license. It was published by Paizo Publishing in response to the then upcoming 4E version of D&D's more restrictive game license system, which would have afforded less freedom in publishing content within D&D systems. Pathfinder was at times more popular than D&D during the 4E period, though this changed upon the release of 5E. However, it does still have a significant following. Pathfinder is set in the world of Galarian and has had multiple forms of media based on the system, including books, card games and video games. Some still consider Pathfinder to be the superior RPG system. TSR Oh boy. This is where we delve a bit deeper into the politics and business surrounding D&D, and as always, it's pretty spicy. We've already heard a bit about TSR in the Gary Gygax entry, though here we'll delve a bit deeper. First, as a reminder, TSR is the original publishing company for D&D created by Gary Gygax and Don Kay. The first dispute surrounds Dave Arnson, the co-creator of D&D along with Gygax. Gygax did not acknowledge Arnson's intellectual property claims of later versions of D&D, claiming that Advanced Dungeons & Dragons was significantly different to 1E and not a game which Arnson helped to create. This was resolved, finally, in 1997, after D&D was at that point owned by Wizards of the Coast, for the purposes of releasing Advanced Dungeons & Dragons under the Dungeons & Dragons name. The fee Arnson received was not disclosed. In 1973, Brian Bloom was brought into TSR to help finance the company. However, when Don Kay died suddenly in 1975, the company was run by Gygax and Bloom alone. Gygax reluctantly allowed Brian's father, Melvin, to buy Don's widow's share, which left the Blooms with the majority share. Brian's brother, Kevin, later purchased Melvin's shares, which gave the brothers a controlling interest in the company. The company was split by the Blooms into TSR Inc. and TSR Entertainment, giving Gygax presidency of TSR Entertainment to develop TV and movie opportunities. This is why Gygax was living in Hollywood when we talked about this period of his life in the Gary Gygax section. Later, Gygax found out that much of the financial issues TSR faced were down to Brian Bloom's mismanagement and he successfully had Brian removed by the board. He then used his 700 share stock option to give himself majority control of the company and made himself CEO and president. He hired Lorraine Williams as a company manager and then dismissed the other three directors. This backfired though, as the Blooms triggered their own stock option and sold it to Lorraine Williams, giving her majority share. Gygax attempted to prevent this through the courts, but was unsuccessful. Williams then took the role of president and CEO herself and told Gygax that no further creative contributions to TSR would be accepted. The following year, Gygax resigned all positions at TSR and settled his disputes with TSR, losing the rights to almost everything except a few individual characters. Spicy stuff, and whilst I do feel for Gary, he pulled a fair few shenanigans himself. Barbarians A barbarian, as you might guess, is a class combination of a bard and barbarian. As a combination, it could lead to an interesting character to roleplay, and does have the benefit of making a bard more useful in combat, and a barbarian more useful out of combat. It does have limitations as a build, specifically in that barbarian rage would interrupt the concentration required for some spells. However, bardic inspiration is unaffected and can be used during a rage. You can find a link of how to create the character in the description below. Overthinking. Hang on Dave, are you sure you just want to walk through that door? In fact, while we walk in at all, what if something happens? Frankly Dave, I'm starting to think we should just stop playing. We've all been overly cautious at times. Sometimes an inflection in our DM's voice might make us suspicious. Other times, it's all in our minds. 
In some ways, I think all players need to play over cautiously at some point, if only to better understand when they're overdoing it. An element of overthinking makes players better, I think, though a complete lack of thought is what sometimes leads to the best stories. No judgement here either way, play the game you want to play. Munchkin We've already been over power gaming in the metagaming entry in the tip of this iceberg. A munchkin is a power gamer who has the additional trait of competitiveness. They don't just want to be the best at the table, they want to win the game against the other players. It's a derogatory term, and an old one at that, apparently dating back to 1984. D&D Animated Show An animated show based on D&D, simply called Dungeons & Dragons, was produced by Marvel and TSR from 1983 to 1985. It was animated by Toei Animation, who also animated the Dragon Ball series. I almost included a joke about 10 sequential episodes of DBZ using the same four frames of animation whilst Goku charges a spirit bomb, but I'm too big of a fan of Dragon Ball to do Toei dirty like that for laughs. The premise of the Dungeons & Dragons show is that a group of children and teenagers are transported to the world of D&D and must find their way home. They're aided in this journey by Dungeon Master and have a primary antagonist in the form of the wizard Venga. They face other enemies throughout, including Tiamat, who we've already discussed, and each protagonist has magical items which support them in their journey, which specifically relate to their class role. The show's final episode was never released, as the series was cancelled before it could be produced. However, the script had already been written, and had been available online for some time. Fans have animated the script and uploaded it online, so those who want to watch the ending can do so with relative ease. Though, as a warning, the ending itself is more definitive than the script intended, and the clips are largely reused from elsewhere in the series. Infinity Engine and NN The Infinity Engine is a game engine developed by Bioware, which was the engine used to create five iconic D&D licensed isometric RPGs, including Baldur's Gate, Planescape Torment, Icewind Dale, Baldur's Gate 2, and Icewind Dale 2. There are also various expansions and enhanced editions which use the engine, however those were the main franchises. The Infinity Engine was initially an RTS engine, but was repurposed for isometric RPGs and licensed to Black Isle Studios. In more recent years, fans have reverse engineered the engine and created tools to edit game files with an open source recreation even being available to develop on. The Infinity Engine was succeeded by the Aurora Engine, which was the engine used to create the Neverwinter Nights RPGs. That was my first foray into the Forgotten Realms, so I do have fond memories playing that series. Ed Greenwood As we already know from the last section of the iceberg, Ed Greenwood was the original creator of the Forgotten Realms setting. In day-to-day -day life, Greenwood is a library clerk, which makes a lot of sense considering his love of books and publishing. Greenwood also regularly attends D&D conventions dressed as Elminster from his Elminster series of books, so in many ways I think Ed Greenwood is what many aspire to be. Passionate about his interests, successful and popular within his community and unapologetically himself. I won't go on for too long, and certainly we don't want to come across as a giddy fanboy, but I do have an enormous respect for Ed Greenwood. I cast Fireball, stroke Eldritch Blast. I think this entry refers to the tendency for some wizards and warlocks with their wide range of spells to default to either Fireball or Eldritch Blast. It's easy to see why. Both spells are very effective combat spells in most situations, and for Warlocks, this is especially important considering their more limited spellbooks. If you're a DM who's had enough of players using the same spells, there are lots of ways you might address it. You could use Fire or Force Resistant Enemies, have enemies use Counter Spell and other similar spells, you could think about enemy placement in encounters to disincentivize the spells, and could even look at spell components and use effects to limit those components to encourage more creative play. That said, some players are less interested in combat and prefer other RPG mechanics, interactions and exploration. So as long as your players are having fun, I don't think it's the end of the world if there's a warlock sitting at the back, shooting a few beams of energy out of his hands. If I'd made the spirit bomb joke earlier, a lazy Kamehameha joke would have been perfect here. Arkhan steals the hand of Vecna. Spoiler warning, skip to the next section if you're currently watching Critical Role. Arkan is a Dragonborn Paladin stroke Barbarian played by Joe Manganiello in the Critical Role podcast. He was a player character who, along with the main party, fought Vecna, an arch lich who at that point had ascended to godhood. 
The party managed to seal Vecna's divine form outside of the Prime Material Plane, beyond the Divine Gate, to permanently seal him away. The only thing remaining was his hand. Arkin announced that it was time to destroy the hand of Vecna, however at the last minute, he chopped off his own hand, attached Vecna's hand to himself, healed himself, and teleported away. It was an epic betrayal, and one which has gone down as legendary for those that watch Critical Role. Out of character, Joe had spoken with the DM about his character's motivations previously, so it wasn't a total shock, however Matt did not know how Joe intended to try to steal it, so was likely as entertained as the rest of us. Red Box The Red Box is the D&D game's starter set, containing a player book and a DM book, as well as character sheets, maps, tokens, dice and cards to help new players get started with D&D. From what I can tell, the 4E version is what is usually referred to as the Red Box. However, the 1983 revision of the original basic set is when the first Red Box was released. The basic sets will be the first experience many players and DMs have with D&D, especially before online platforms and resources became so prevalent. So for those that have been playing for some time, the Red Boxes will be quite nostalgic. The prices of certain editions certainly reflect that. Bonus. Forever DM. The person in the group who is most into D&D is often, unfortunately, also the one who never gets to play. Being a DM is fun in its own right, but it takes a lot of time and preparation to give players fulfilling role-playing experiences, so even the most enthusiastic and committed DM has probably wanted to just play D&D sometimes. However, either because none of their players know enough about D&D to DM, or they just don't have the time or will, they must remain the forever DM. My own DM had been a forever DM for some time, however he's recently found another group to play with, which brings me great joy. I've run a couple of one-shots before, however he is actually unable to attend both, which did not bring me joy. Bonus 2. Racist? This is a broad topic, the question of whether D&D is racist or not. It's another controversy surrounding D&D, much like the Satanic Panic, though one which I think should be taken more seriously. I think in some ways, D&D could always be labelled as having elements of racism by design, as different player races have different essential attributes, and there are even similar personality traits among particular races, which necessarily leads to tropes and stereotypes, even if they are only of fancy creatures. Whilst races in D&D are more distinct than ethnic races in the real world, and they are effectively different species, it could be argued that the presence of these differences might reinforce stereotypes to players in the real world, though here, I think it is important to note that this conclusion is probably another moral panic, as I doubt D&D has ever made anyone racist. Rather, it's far more likely that the racist who plays D&D was already a racist. I could be wrong though, so I would always keep an open mind and it's definitely a question worth asking. Other questions around racism in D&D could surround the origin of some of the races, and whether even though they're fancy creatures, they're built on a racist foundation, which were just veiled stereotypes of real ethnicities or cultures. For example, orcs being evil, uncivilised and brutish does bear a similarity to some historic racist attitudes towards non-Western cultures. Whilst that's an important question to ask, orcs were a fancy staple before D&D, so the question is one that needs to be aimed at the fancy genre as a whole rather than one at D&D specifically. There could also be the unintentional and non-malicious forms of racism in certain modules, representing stereotypes of real ethnicities, such as oriental adventures, which can be insensitive at times and utilised harmful tropes. I don't have a strong position on racism in D&D. To be clear, I'm a staunch anti-racist and would not support racism in any form. However, in this case, I don't feel equipped enough to really say one way or the other if D&D is definitively racist. It's clear there have been cultural insensitivities in the past, however Wizards of the Coast are grappling with the question and doing what they can to avoid insensitivities in the future. The other question of different player races having different characteristics really isn't avoidable by design and are intrinsic to gameplay. However, they don't seem to be based in any real racist racial tropes to me, though again, the Orc case in particular might show something darker in the fantasy genre as a whole, even if it isn't something unique to D&D. Bonus 3. No demons stroke devils in AD&D. Moving back to the more ridiculous controversies of D&D, the second edition of Advanced Dungeons & Dragons actually had reference to devils and demons removed as a result of the moral panic surrounding Satanism and D&D. It isn't totally clear if they're removed to appease the moral panickers, or if they're removed to protect players from being targeted, but their removal was in name only. Devils were simply renamed the Bartizu, 
and demons renamed the Tanari. It's still an interesting piece of D&D history though. Middle of the Iceberg This is the first section where you really only know if you know. At this point, you would need to be a D&D enthusiast to know the entries. Browsing 4chan and Reddit is likely not enough, unless you're specifically browsing TG or D&D next. Spelljammer Spelljammer is both a setting and a ship. The setting is a fantasy setting based in outer space. It's based predominantly on the prime material plane, so even though travellers may go into space, they're often not plane hopping. The setting is like other D&D settings, with the ships being more like galleons than rockets, and it's explained in setting by crystal spheres which surround planets, wild space beyond and between those, and spell jamming helms and gravity atmosphere fields on ships which allow navigation of the wild space between spheres. The Spelljammer ship is a living ship that looks like a manta ray and has a city on its back. It travels between different spheres aimlessly whilst unmanned, though with more direction if it has a captain. If it's destroyed, one of its spawn, the small jammers will become the next Spelljammer, however there can only be one full ship at a time. Spelljamming is just the process of travelling between crystal spheres and has been used as a way of connecting different D&D worlds stroke settings though the Planescape setting later replaced Spelljammer setting as the predominant means of connecting settings, which fits with the Great Wheel cosmology more neatly. Though, each subsequent edition of D&D has had some reference to Spelljammer content. Mazes and Monsters You might recognise this name from the Satanic Panic in the last video. Mazes and Monsters was first a novel and later a movie, which was based on the story of James Dallas Egbert III. It lent into the discredited interpretation that James was LARPing a version of D&D and became lost in the tunnels beneath his school. The made-for-TV version of the story, starring Tom Hanks, tells a story wherein a group of troubled teens meet, organise a LARP, and in the process, Robbie, Tom Hanks' character, suffers a permanent psychotic break, with the movie ending showing him stuck in fiction. It was certainly a product of the moral panic surrounding D&D at the time. Cobalt Press Cobalt Press, or Open Design, is a game company who produce role-playing games and supplements. Initially, they had a focus on the patronage crowdfunding model for game releases, wherein games have limited releases for backers, however more recently they have released games publicly, and even been commissioned to produce adventures by Wizards of the Coast. Chainmail We've already made reference to Chainmail in the section on Gary Gygax. Developed with Jeff Perrin, Chainmail was a medieval miniature game that preceded Dungeons and Dragons. The game is much closer to fantasy wargaming systems like Warhammer, with rules for both mass combat and one-to-one -one combat. All Barbarian Party What are you guys playing? A Dwarven Barbarian. I also rolled a Barbarian. We all roll Barbarians too. Well gents, let's do this. The story is too long for me to read out in its entirety but this story is another classic green text story. I've left a link in the description below, but there's lots of humour surrounding a mostly illiterate party, the misguided attempts at magic, and a final heroic confrontation, which involves a bag of holding and portable hull. Rest in peace, Eurus. City of Brass The City of Brass is a floating city on the elemental plane of fire. The city itself sits in a 40 mile hemisphere of brass, which is what gives the city the ability to fly the city hovers very slowly. Many of the effects of the plane of fire are suppressed within the city limits to facilitate interplanar trade. However, the general alignment of the city does hinder those of good alignment due to the surrounding portals which lead to the Nine Hells. The city is governed by the Grand Sultan. It's by his will that the effects of the plane of fire are suppressed. The Sultan is a freak, as is the city. 20% of the population are slaves to the Afriti masters. Many of these slaves originally came to the city of Brass as tourists, but by defaulting on loans or committing other offences, were made slaves for a period of time. These slaves are often tasked with cultivating the obsidian fields, which host crops found from across the plain of fire. Pun pun. I've called min-maxers out up until this point. But what a min-maxer does is still a fundamentally interesting question, even if it doesn't make for a fun role-playing experience. How powerful can I make myself by manipulating in-game mechanics? 
enter Pun Pun, the world's strongest kobold. Pun Pun is quite literally the pinnacle of creation, the most powerful you can make a playable character through cheesing. It's complicated to summarise exactly how Pun Pun achieves his demigodhood, and I'll probably butcher it, but essentially, Pun Pun has a divine minion, which has the fast wild shape ability, which allows Pun Pun to wild shape into a Saruk. Pun Pun then uses assumed supernatural ability to use the manipulate form ability, which he then uses to give the manipulate form ability to his divine minion. Pun Pun then dismisses the Saruk form. Then, the divine minion gives Pun Pun the manipulate form ability, using the manipulate form ability, which is very important. Pun Pun can now cast giant size on his divine minion, which gives plus 32 strength. It can then use manipulate form to give Pun Pun plus 32 strength permanently, which is based on the viper's own stats at that point. Pun Pun then dismisses giant size on the minion, casts it on himself, then casts manipulate form on his minion to also increase his minion's base stats. This can go on ad infinitum. For other spells, other ability scores can be increased in the same way, and with such arbitrarily high stats, other spells, abilities and attacks can easily be gained through further cheesing. The reason this works really boils down to the fact that the wording of manipulate form allows you to only increase other people's scores based on your own score. But as you have a temporary boost, which you give them, then change form back to normal and receive it back yourself, it creates the ability to make that boost permanent. There's a lot more to this character build, but for the sake of brevity, I've tried to keep it brief. See the link in the description below for a full breakdown of what is possible. Blibdul Pulp The Quotau are amphibious fishmen. They were enslaved by mind flares, and this enslavement had a permanent effect on the psyche of the people. To put it bluntly, they were completely and utterly mad. Through the intensity of their madness and religious fervour, they willed their own gods into existence through their insanity alone. Blibdul Pulp is their patron goddess and protector. She has the head and claws of a lobster and body of a naked woman. Known as the Sea Mother, she was irrational and unpredictable herself and had a strong hatred towards mind flares and drows who caused suffering to her people. The goddess would accept offerings of pearls, lobsters and dead drow for favour and could bestow either positive or negative magical effects on others. She could make you mad or allow you the ability to cast a spell to transform a hand into a lobster claw. She at one point owned a necklace which could produce pearls, however this was stolen by the demigoddess Dian Castra after she disguised herself as a Quel Tao. TG TG is the 4chan board dedicated to tabletop gaming. It's a source for most of the green text we have already seen in this iceberg, as well as many more. The board is open to all forms of tabletop gaming, but Warhammer, Magic the Gathering, Yu-Gi-Oh and D&D make up a large part of the content, as you might expect. As far as 4chan goes, it's a board which is mostly dedicated to the hobbies themselves, and whilst I wouldn't necessarily say it's free from the worst aspects of 4chan, the community is focused on the hobby and don't have the same negative attitudes as some other boards. Still a lot of cringe at times though. 1D4chan 1D4chan is a wiki which is dedicated to the TG board. It has entries on the games themselves, but also on memes and green texts which originated on the TG board. It's a great resource for someone like me who's doing a video on D&D. Its server has been up and down over the years, but it's currently very much up. End of part two. And that's it for this entry. As I said, I'm not promising a timeline on the next video, but I expect it to take a lot less time than this video. Don't forget to subscribe to support me and be notified when the next part is out. Ciao.